Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. We're so glad you've joined us. Today you'll meet two people who have defined greatness in a very unique way. One by choice, the other by circumstances. We have a powerful story of a quadruple amputee who mm -hmm. shares how faith got her through the darkest days of her life. And meet the marathon man who is still running strong at only, guess what? 101 years of age. Come on. I, that just shocks me. I just have no idea. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Oh, it's an incredible story. How do you define greatness, Brian? Um, doing simple things with an extraordinary passion. Mm, that's good. That's good. What about yourself? Well, I like your definition. I think that's really, that's really <laughs> helpful. Uh, you know, greatness, hmm. Can I steal Jesus' words? You sure. Know? I think it's uh, I think it's great when we understand what it means to be meek. Okay. Meekness to me is it's power under control. Yes. And I think when power is under control, it's a beautiful thing, mm -hmm. and it makes for greatness. Yeah. You know, Jesus certainly was like that. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't think there's a, a better definition. And in my life, I've seen whether it's in poetry where where people. Uh, have really pinned words or whether it's in athletics where I've seen people do things that everyone else does but that simple thing they do it with such passion yeah. that it just echoes in your mind and you're saying wow that was just great yeah. right Barishnikov yeah. you know moving and jumping and doing uh, inspires others greatness yeah. inspires others doesn't it yeah and later in the show, Pastor Robin Waller is here with a powerful lesson on perseverance. But first, this is how Cindy Wilkins found the faith to overcome a quadruple amputation. It's amazing. In my world, I went to sleep one night and I'd been holding my three-month-old baby and sending my five-year-old girl off to school. And I awoke the next day, but it had been five weeks and I'd been in a coma. And I looked up and Mark was standing over me and he had this very intense look of love in his eyes. And he said, honey, you've been very ill and they've had to amputate your hands and feet. Mark and Cindy lived the typical life. Both were driven in their careers until ultimately deciding to settle down and start a family. But not long after the arrival of their second child, Cindy suddenly fell ill. In February of 2011, I was a wife and a mom and a business manager. I was on maternity leave and my son had the croup, so I would take him back and forth to the hospital. And after the last visit, I spiked a fever. I had a strange ache in my right leg and I started vomiting. That became more aggressive and I became more and more ill. There was two different uh, 911 calls. The first crew came and said, oh, your wife has a bad flu and she needs to take some medicine and rest. And the next day we realized that this wasn't a regular flu. We called 911 again and they came and then they rushed her to uh, emergency. Ensuring the kids were all right, Mark raced to the hospital, unaware that his wife was in a fight for her life. On my way there, my cell phone rang. It was the hospital calling. It was a nurse mm -hmm. and uh, she said, uh, do you realize how serious this is? Like, my wife said, oh, I understand. Well, we need to hear right away. You need to make some decisions. I get to the hospital that night, lots of doctors around Cindy. I had to sign off on them putting Cindy in a coma so she could uh, fight this bacterial infection. They didn't know it was flesh-eating disease at that point. And they induced Cindy in a coma, put her up into uh, ICU. They diagnosed me with necrotizing fasciitis. Eventually, my kidneys, liver, heart, and respiratory system failed. And my hands and feet went from blue to purple to black. And they started dying, shriveling. Every day I was at the hospital and the same head doctor would tell me, I don't think your wife's gonna make it. Every day, came home one night around 11 p.m. We had lots of friends, family helping us out with the kids. They're at our house. And uh, one of my friends pulled me aside and said, uh, Mark, you know, we've been talking and you know, just take a look at Cindy. We don't know what's going on with her hands and feet. They're black, they're shriveled, that fleshing disease eating away at her leg. Doctors say she probably has brain damage. What kind of life is she gonna have? And you may want to think about pulling that plug and she may not want to even live. 
The weight of this reality was almost too much for Mark to bear. He drove back to the hospital to be with his dying wife. The nurses let me in. I said, I need to pray with my wife. And I said my first real honest prayer to the Lord on my knees beside Cindy's bed. I said, God, I need to know if Cindy wants to live, if she wants to die, if I need to pull the plug. I, I don't know what to do here. It's, it, it's not my decision to make. A desperate Mark searched for an answer to his prayers. And a few short days later, God delivered it in a way that left no doubt. It was my mother-in-law. And she left me a voicemail. She said, Mark, I don't know how to say this, but I'm supposed to give you a message. I've been hearing voices and, and it sounds like angels singing all morning saying, Cindy wants to live. She needs more time. Don't pull the plug. To me, this was the evidence I needed. Like God was in control. And it's like this burden about Cindy's illness and everything going on, I just left. It was like it just washed away. I knew she was going to live. I knew he was real. I knew he was in control. And I went upstairs to the ICU and I, I, I walked into that uh, doctor that kept telling me every day that she's going to die. <laughs> and before he could say anything, I said, you know what, she's going to live. You see, you'll see. I know she's going to live. God told me so. Cindy began to stabilize, but the damage to her hands and feet were irreversible. That left Mark with another difficult decision. And I had a call from the doctor at about 11.30 at night. We need you to make a decision and to sign off the paperwork. Uh, we're going to have to amputate all four of Cindy's limbs. When I woke up from the coma and Mark told me that I had lost my hands and feet, I couldn't believe it. And my first thoughts were of my children. How would I take care of them? And how could I do anything for myself? And really cried out to God, why would you do this to me? And a nurse walked in and read me Psalm 139. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And it goes on to talk about how we are created at the beginning of time, and that God created me with great love and great hope for my future. And I just, in that moment, knew that he would be the one who would carry me through. And we have an opportunity to, to allow him to carry it for us. I knew that God was all powerful. I had been told that since I was a child, but I didn't know how I was going to overcome it. As I lay in the coma, I felt the whispering in my heart that I needed to write this story. And I felt the whispering in my heart that I would be able to shine his light. We found great purpose in all of this. It wasn't our purpose. It was his purpose. It was really horrible what happened. We endured much pain and suffering. And sometimes we don't know in trial, why is this happening to us? Why, why do I have to endure this? And certainly our trials didn't end there. But God had a purpose. He came in and carried us through. And shine on is a reflection of that light that we are all called to shine for Him. I just love this story. It's so inspiring. I mean, I honestly don't know how I would handle if I had this disease come on me like Cindy did. I mean, you know, quadruple amputee. How do you function in life? And yet, I just see such an incredible demonstration of faith. You know, there her husband refused to believe the doctors, really. He marched into that room and he just told the doctors, <laughs> like it was, that she would live and not die and that they were believing for a, a fruitful life for her and that God had purposes in this. That took a lot of courage for her husband to do that because I'm sure there were many people around him that 
weren't necessarily having the same kind of faith that he had. I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're facing something that's so difficult and it looks like there is no hope or a future. I hope Cindy's story has inspired you and the response of her husband and those around her to say, we're gonna believe God. You know, sometimes when we're in the darkest places of our life, Psalm 139 is a beautiful Psalm that reminds us that God actually has every day planned for us and he has good purposes for us in our life. And even though we may feel like we're in this very, very dark time, it's not dark to God. Listen to what Psalm 139 says in verse 11. Surely the darkness, it won't hide me. And the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day. That is having faith. When you believe that even though all you can see is the darkness, the darkness is not dark to God. He sees right through it. And he wants you to go through the darkness with him. He wants you to have faith. Would you call us now? The number's on the screen. I just feel like somebody's sitting there going, I just don't know if I can trust God with this. You can. It's called faith. Ask God to give you faith because he gives it generously. Up next, meet the 101-year-old man who's still running marathons. Wow. At 101 years young, Orville Rogers still has a spring in his step and shows no signs of slowing down. The former airline pilot still remembers the day he fell in love with flying. I was a young boy about 10 years old in Lindbergh Circle, my schoolhouse, 1927, after his transatlantic solo flight. That cemented my desire to be a pilot. Around that same time, Orville felt another call. He came to faith in Christ and has never looked back. In this little town of Sulphur, Oklahoma, my mother took my sister and me across the street to a Southern Baptist small church. And one Sunday night, I just felt God calling to repent of my sins and trust Him as my Lord and Savior. It is a decision I have never regretted. Orville received his bachelor's degree from the University of Oklahoma and was enrolled in seminary in 1940 when World War II broke out. I uh, asked him if I could enlist in the Army Air Corps and learn to fly instead of being in the walking army, and they said, sure. So that was God's way of turning me around from what I perceived to be a career in vocational Christian service to one of every bit as important, a layman in God's service doing his work for his glory. That work included a 30-year career as a commercial pilot, as well as flying missionary trips to South America and Africa. In 1965, I met the founder of Wycliffe Bible Translators, William Cameron Townsend, said, I'm an airline pilot. There's no way I can plug into your program. He said, well, we have an airplane in Miami, and then they asked me to fly it to Bogota which was my first ferry flight experience with Wycliffe or Southern Baptist. I eventually ended up ferrying 46 missionary airplanes, 20 of them inside the United States. 26 of them were in South America or over the Atlantic or Pacific Oceans. And that was quite a challenge to, uh, to fly across an ocean in a single engine airplane. Orville and his wife moved to Dallas, where Orville began flying for Braniff Airlines. Most of my flying for Braniff was domestic inside the United States, but the last 15 or 16 months, I flew to South America flying the stretched DC-8, which at that time was one of the largest airplanes in, in airline service. We had one flight that flew from New York to Buenos Aires. 10 hours and 40 minutes. But at that time, I think we had the longest flight in the airline industry. 
Along the way, Orville and his wife also began investing in real estate and the oil and gas industries, which enabled them to later support many ministries. My wife and I determined that we had to increase our giving, which we did, and God blessed our investments. In the course of my wife and I, our marriage together, and since her death, she and I have given away over $35 million to God's work. Now to put that in perspective, uh, you need to realize that my total earnings from Braniff and the Air Corps and Air Force were about a million six hundred thousand dollars. So God was able to multiply that, I think because of our faithfulness. One mission trip to Russia in 2004 brought Orville full circle. In 1952, I was flying the B-36, the largest airplane in the world and our primary retaliatory strike force against Russia, if war had broken out. My target was located just on the north side of Moscow. 52 years later, in 2004, my wife and I were on a missionary team. We docked on the northwest side of Moscow. We had our medical clinics and did street witnessing, all within about five miles of where my target was to drop an atom bomb. Instead of uh, death and destruction from above, we were carrying in God's word, the word of life to the Russian people. He also became a long distance runner after reading several studies on longevity and exercise. Dr. I Min Lee from Brigham and Women's Hospital, she compiled a study. Her conclusion was that people who exercise very vigorously for long periods of time could expect to get back in added lifespan, nine hours of added life for every one hour of physical exercise. That is phenomenal. Orville not only ran a number of marathons, he holds two world records in the 90 to 100 age category. I entered two races in Boston, Massachusetts, March the 23rd, 2008, the 800 meter and the one mile run. And three weeks before the race, my wife died. And I talked to my children about it, and we agreed she'd want me to continue to compete, so I did. And I won the 800 meters, set a new world record. The mile record, I really slaughtered. I ran it in 957. Two years ago, Orville wrote his life story in his book, The Running Man. It tells of my experiences in, in life, my flying, my running, my giving, and my family life. And I hope it's a, a benefit and a help to people who may be questioning how they need to serve the Lord better. Orville says his desire has always been to run the race well, as the Apostle Paul encourages us, and to finish well. I never ask God for fame, riches, or long life and he's given me all three. I don't want to uh, fail my Lord in the last days of my life. I have seen too many people, too many examples of people in public life who failed somehow or other in their later years to keep their high moral standards. That's the primary prayer of my life these days, that I will live well for Jesus as long as he gives me life and breath. I just love Orville's heart, don't you? And he started running at 50. I mean, he just he just set the bar really high. I wonder if you're out there feeling like, well, I've got uh, all the bursitis, uh, I've got I've got all of the arthritic conditions and everything. And then you look at Orville and you're saying, what in the world am I waiting for? He literally just put the gauntlet down and he says, it's time to get out there and start moving. I love what he and his wife did though, and. Uh, I really believe that was the, the anti-aging that God gave them. He gave them a purpose because he said he never asked for long life, he never asked for riches, and he, he never asked for fame, but God gave me all three. Wow, what a powerful statement. Sounds like Solomon of old. And uh, the scripture says something very interesting. It says in Psalms 90, it says... Uh, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. 13, it says, return to the Lord. I believe when we return just focusing on God 
and saying, Lord, I want all of my days to really be full and I want them to make a difference, the Lord honors that prayer. I want to get something into your hands that you would think boldly. You may not be running a marathon, but you can do something that could literally just change those around you and your world as well. 1-855-759-0700. And at the end, this is what really struck me. He says, I've seen so many people that did not end well because they didn't stay the course. I want to pray with you that you'll stay the course and you'll end well, not with a scandal, not with an issue. Father, over your servant, I pray now, Matthew 6, that as they seek the kingdom of God and your righteousness, all else will be added, but they would finish strong in Jesus' name. Amen. If that's you, say, Pastor B, I'm in. We'll be right back with a lesson on perseverance from Pastor Robin Waller. Discover wisdom, find favor, and receive the blessings of God. CBN presents Pat Robertson's latest audio CD, The Transforming Word, Volume 3. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body. Plus, as a special bonus, you'll receive a DVD of Pat's teaching, The Three Blessings. You'll enter into wisdom, you'll enjoy favor, you'll be filled with the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. Available now. Hey, my name is Robin Waller. I'm the lead pastor of Lift Church, a church on a mission to see churches thriving on our college and university campuses. I want to tell you a quick story about my friend Andy from Australia. There's a big party that happens every year in Australia when people graduate from high school. It's called schoolies. And what happens is tens of thousands of students, every student from the country, congregates in this one place to throw a gigantic party. I mean, out of control, like people throwing couches off of balconies out of control. My friend Andy walked into this situation and he saw the chaos. And rather than despairing or wanting to walk away from it, he asked the question, how can I make it better? How can I make it tastier? That is actually the question that Jesus calls us to ask. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Salt makes everything tastier. It makes everything better. So as my friend Andy walks into that environment, what started with a simple question, how can I make it better, began with him serving one student, and then two students, and then 10 students. And now today, they are in dozens and dozens of universities, colleges, they're across the world, they're even right here in Canada. All started with a simple question, how can I make it better? Jesus' invitation to be salt, for us to make things better, is actually a part of God's character himself. All through the scriptures, we see God taking things that are unhealthy, things that are broken, and redeeming them. We serve and we follow a God that is a redeeming God who looks at brokenness and asks the question, how can I redeem it? When Jesus says to you and he says to me, you need to be the salt of the earth, he's inviting us to ask that question, how can I enter into the world and make it better? So let's bring this home, let's, let's bring this right to your world. As you walk into work tomorrow, maybe you're stressed out, maybe your colleagues have been grumbling a little bit about your boss, or maybe at home things have been a little bit unstable, it's been difficult to find a good rhythm. The temptation is to start to grumble, to start to think about why it's not very good, to think of all the things that are wrong. But when Jesus says you need to be salt, his instruction to you is make it better. Ask the question, instead of joining the grumbling, Instead of assuming that it can't get better, ask the question, Jesus, how can I be like you? How can I make this better? How can I improve it? How can I bring health to this environment? How can I make it tastier? That's what it means to be salty. So that would be my invitation to you today. As you step into that environment that has been challenging you, where you feel a temptation to join the grumbling, to join the negativity, ask the question, how can I be salt? How can I make it better?
Lori, the whole day we've been talking about running the race that is set before us. I, I don't even really like to run, Brian. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> I get running the race of life, though. Yeah. And that 101-year-old man, that just, I don't even understand. Did right? he Did he pretty much lay the gauntlet oh, for you? Oh, man. But most people don't know, though. But yeah. you as a figure skater, but also uh, in skating cheer yeah. and, and all of the things that mm -hmm. you have done. So it's not that you don't. No. And you love to hike as well. I love to actually walk. I love to work out. I love yeah. doing lots of sporting things. But just running isn't my thing. Well, but, you know, you know. It, same way with myself. If I had to run more than 40 yards, I was so angry I was tackling the guy <laughs> to stop running, right? That's You'll right. You'll get that on the way Boy, home. Boy, we sure yeah. saw some stories of greatness today, though, didn't we? Yes, like, we, did. we can define yeah. greatness by, like, running the race, persevering. Yes. I mean, in, in Cindy's story and, you know, just getting through life when things are difficult is truly a sign of greatness. You're absolutely right. And they have really inspired me. And I pray it's inspired you. You know, we have a race here at the 700 Club Canada, and we believe that it is a mission possible. But we need your help to continue the race. For just $20 a month, you can become a monthly partner. And we'd love to get into your hands this inspiring word of God. And it really allows you to not only position your mind for greatness, but also help you help us move this ministry forward. 1-855-759-0700. Prayer partners are standing by. It would be such an encouragement if you'd call. Well, you know, we we love your prayer requests. We love your praise reports. We love your comments mm -hmm. that you're leaving on, whether it's Facebook Live, where you watch the show every day, That's or the message that you're sending to us. I mean, I've heard so many am amazing messages lately about yes. people that are watching and how their lives are being changed, Brian. Yes. But let's pray for Esther from Alberta. Everything she wants, everything God has for her, to be bold and courageous. That's a good prayer, Esther. Why don't you do that? Well, Father, I lift up Esther, and I ask for boldness and courage, and I pray that that would spread right across our country, that those of us who follow Jesus would be known for our perseverance and for being faithful to run the race. In Jesus' name, In amen. Jesus' name. Hey, if you haven't heard your prayer request on here, we're praying for you behind the scenes. And continue to persevere, because God has a great race marked for you. Until next time, God bless. Now there are more ways to connect with the 700 Club Canada online. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash 700 Club Canada. Find us on Instagram at 700 Club Canada or follow us on Twitter at 700 Club Canada. Just email cba at 700club.ca or visit us at 700club.ca.